Good afternoon to everybody and welcome to the new series of seminars Artificial Intelligence and Mathematics Fundamentals and Beyond. We remind that these meetings aim to bring together scientists of different fields to create a common ground for discussion and to help bridge the gap between data, machine learning theory, mathematical models and tools. It's a great honor to start with Professor Gita Kutiniok. Gita Coutinho is the Bavarian AI Chair for Mathematical Foundation of Artificial Intelligence at the Ludwig Maximilians Universitat München. She took her diploma in mathematics and computer science in 1996 and her PhD in mathematics in 2000 at Universitat Paderborn. She started to travel abroad mainly US, visiting the most prestigious university, Georgia Tech, Washington University, Princeton, Stanford, Yale, and ATH in Zurich. Since 2016, she is an ordinary member of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities. Since 2019, she is a IEEE senior member and SIAM fellow. Moreover, she is the vice president at large of SIAM. In 2021, she organized jointly with Peter Bartlett, Anders Hansen, Arnulf Jensen, and Carol Bibian Shirley the six month program Mathematics of Deep Learning at the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. She is the recipient of a big quantity of projects. In particular, we remind just the very recent one. Indeed, she coordinates the four years DFG Priority Program Theoretical Foundations of Deep Learning, the four years project Deep Learning Basierte Regularisierung Inverse Problem, the third year research focus Next Generation AI at the Center for Advanced Studies at LMU Munich, all of them started in 2021. Moreover, she is one of the coordinators of one Munich Strategy Forum project, Next Generation Human Centered Robotics, Human Embodiment and System Agency in Trustworthy AI for the Future of Health, started this year and ending in 2025. And now let's start with Gita Kutiniuk. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so very much, Natalia, for the very nice introduction and also for the invitation. It's certainly a great pleasure and also an honor for me to give uh, this lecture here. So from my perspective, it's a very exciting time actually for mathematics um, concerning artificial intelligence, a lot of directions uh, one can take. And so in this talk, I would also like to give you in a bit an overview of what the current uh, key directions are in this regime and then also show you some uh, recent results. I think, I mean, we all know how tremendously successful deep learning is in various areas. So in particular in public life, things of self-driving cars, of telecommunication, speech recognition, and also in, in some countries, legal issues are already decided upon by AI-based approaches. And then also the whole healthcare sector, which unfortunately these days became even more important than it already is. And then if we move to science, um, we also see spectacular successes uh, in these areas. So this is just one of various examples, um, which is concerning protein folding. And maybe you saw those news, uh, the new deep learning program basically outperforms everything which has been done before uh, in predicting uh, folding structures. And you see the headline of the news, it will change everything, makes gigantic leap in solving protein structures. Now, if we come a bit closer to um, mathematics, then uh, we realize that uh, maybe artificial intelligence entered uh, mathematics around 2012, um, in particular first in the area of inverse problems and imaging science. Uh, these are just a couple of examples uh, of tasks where deep learning nowadays, I mean, is extensively used and one could see um, that uh, using these new approaches, uh, one could very easily reach the state of the art oftentimes. Um, that's also not surprising in a sense, because in the area of imaging sciences, there's an often no rigorous model of what an image is. So in that sense, 
These approaches are very uh, accessible by learning type uh, approaches. Then the area of partial differential equations was a bit slower to embrace these methods. Um, you see here it started, I mean, around uh, 2017, uh, but then really took off uh, during the last years. Why? Well, I mean, because a partial differential equation is a rigorous physical model. And so the question is, why do you need learning type approaches at all? But then, I mean, what turned out is that, in fact, um, in the high dimensional regime, often classical methods have the problem that uh, you have to um, face the curse of dimensionality. And so you face high computational costs. And oftentimes with learning type approaches, in particular deep learning, one can circumvent the cross of dimensionality, and that's made what makes these approaches so effective. But then on the other hand, I mean, one could also observe that uh, deep learning is lacking a substantial mathematical foundation. Um, and you see uh, these news, um, so that happens at a big AI conference where Ali Rahimi, who gave plenary talk, stated that um, Machine learning and particularly also deep learning has become a form of alchemy. Ah, so he says, I mean, people don't know, I mean, why to take one architecture over another. So it's a lot of trial and error. And uh, this is certainly a tremendous problem, but I mean, it's even more a problem when you realize that there are, in fact, also serious, um, serious problems with these approaches. So, for instance, concerning trustworthiness. Now, so here is another article here from BBC where it says computers can be made to see a sea turtle as a gun uh, or hear a concerto as someone's voice. And so in that sense, um, one sees that here, in fact, one has uh, problems which one face. And uh, the question is whether with uh, theoretical approaches, mathematical approaches, one can circumvent those. So from my perspective, um, there are two key challenges for mathematics. One challenge is mathematics for deep learning. So asking questions like, can we derive a deep mathematical understanding of deep learning? Can we make deep learning maybe also more robust by providing a substantial theoretical foundation? And then on the other hand, deep learning for mathematics. So can we use these new type of approaches for mathematical problems like inverse problems in imaging sciences or also partial differential equations? And so I would like to show you during this talk, I mean, several examples in both of those directions. So let's, let's start very slowly and let's uh, delve a bit deeper into deep neural networks. Um, most of you might have already seen neural networks and maybe are familiar with it, but still let me give you a, a very gentle introduction and also show you a bit where things actually came from. So in a sense, I mean, everything started with um, McCulloch and Pitts and they their goal was uh, artificial intelligence. And what they did was they wanted to uh, develop an algorithmic approach to learning and uh, the way to go well because humans are very good in learning was uh, very natural. What they did or was, what they attempted to do was to mimic the functionality of the human brain. Now, if you think back to our biology class in high school, we all know to some extent how our brain functions. We have uh, neurons which are connected and then you have signals moving from one neuron to the next. And so what they did was they introduced an artificial neuron. Um, you see, this is a, a real neuron to some extent. You have signals coming in here. These are these X1, X2, X3. Then they are maybe amplified. Um, depending on the dendrite, they move through. And so this is mimicked here by these weights. And then everything arrives at the soma. So what arrives here is the sum over Xi, Wi. And then the neuron has to decide whether to fire or not. And it decides that to some extent, depending on the threshold, which is the bias here. So depending on whether the sum is greater than the bias or not, it fires or it does not fire. Ah, and so then here there are the next neurons and it, it moves through the network. Ah, and so then, I mean, having one artificial neuron, one can certainly connect those and the flexibility um, one 
then has in the end is to learn the weights and the biases. Yeah, so these are the parameters later on of the neural network. That's where the flexibility is in. And so this would be the mathematical definition of an artificial neuron. We have some weights, W1 to Wm. We have the bias term. We have an activation function, um, which is usually a nonlinear function. And then the artificial neuron is defined in this way. Now, and if you now think back to the previous the slide there, what we had here as the activation function, if you go back, uh, we have here the heavy side function. No? So the activation function can be the heavy side function, but it can be also something different. No? So this is what we had on the previous slide, either it fires or not. But rho could also be the sigmoid function if you want to have something smooth. Or you could also have, um, and that's what people typically use these days, the so-called ReLU, the rectifiable linear unit, which is just the max of 0 and x. That looks, in fact, very simplistic. However, I mean, this is what people typically use these days. Okay. Um, so now we have an artificial neuron. We connect that, and um, what we get then is a composition of affine linear maps and activation functions. Now, so here again, I mean, if you haven't seen that, uh, a little example. If you, for instance, here have your neural network, things move from top to bottom. All these yellow circles are now artificial neurons. You see you have something incoming, and you have something outgoing. Also the same here. Yeah, but this you can now encode in this way. Um, what you see here is uh, x is uh, x1, x2, x3. Then you have these connections which are mimicked in this way. This weight times x1 times this weight times x2. Then this connection is mimicked by this, this weight times x3, and the last connection by this, this weight times x3. Yeah, so this um, matrix mimics these connections. Then in here you have the bias terms, the components of your bias vector, which you add. Then you apply your activation function component-wise, and then you keep going. And the next connections are again now mimicked by this matrix. You add the bias term, and so on and so on. Right? So that way you can encode now this network in terms of a mathematical formula using f linear maps and activation functions. And uh, what I say here is that's what you also, uh, I guess, realize if you have very few connections, that certainly leads to sparse matrices. So matrices with a lot of zero entries. OK, so now, I mean, the general definition of a neural network is maybe not that surprising. Um, so that's what you see now here. Um, so maybe take a look here. You have a function from some RD to some RNL, NL typically being equal to 1 if you do classification. And you have here the composition of affine linear maps and activation functions. Again, activation functions applied component-wise. Uh, and so depending on how many affine linear maps you have, that's how many what's called layers you have that plays an important role. Uh, later on, so L is the number of layers here, um, and D the dimension of the input layer. Some people may make a distinction between uh, the architecture of a neural network and the realization of a neural network. We don't we, we, we don't make this here because that becomes quite technical. Still, I mean, um, one can see that with different architectures, so different of these architectures, one can have also the same function. Uh, and so, therefore, sometimes it's useful to make this distinction. OK, so that's a deep neural network. So let's see what we do with that. And that will lead us then to the key mathematical questions we actually need to ask. So what do we do with a neural network? Um, we have a complicated function. Let's say it's maybe even defined on a, on a lower dimensional manifold. Um, and let's say it's a classification function. 
So for instance, here is a little example. Uh, computer scientists like to separate cats from dogs. So let's assume I have here a manifold in the whole space of natural images. And in one direction, I have images of cats. In the other area, images of dogs. And let's say these are mapped to the value 1, and these are mapped to the value 2. So then what I have at hand are sample values, so images and their labels. And what I now do is I split that into a training and a test data set. The test data set I set aside. I only use the training for now. now what I would like to do is, given the samples, I would like to learn this function. How do I do that? Well, I mean, I first need to decide upon the architecture of the deep neural network. Um, so the input dimension is typically clear, but then how many layers you take, how many neurons in each layer, which activation function. Maybe I would like to pre-select certain entries of these matrices to be equal to zero, meaning I don't want to have a fully connected network, but I already want to pre-select certain connections because that makes it easier often to train. So that's the first step. And already that, remembering um, machine learning is alch alchemy, already that, I mean, is lacking a theoretical foundation, uh, a comprehensive one. The next step is the training process. So now I have my architecture. I will need to learn. Uh, so what do, what was the flexibility I have? Well, I need to learn the weights and the biases. Yeah? So I need to learn the F1 linear functions. How do I do that? Well, I mean, what I would like is that if I, uh, so this is my neural network function. If I plug in the Xi's from my samples, I would like, because I would like to learn F, that this is close to f of xi. Ah, and so the closeness is now given by a loss function which I choose. It could be, for instance, the square loss. Yeah, so I could just take the difference squared. That's one possibility. Yeah, and then I sum over all my uh, samples from the training data set. Then sometimes I would like to well, also regularize, because maybe I would like to get a sparsely connected neural network. So I also add a regularization term. Um, maybe the L1 norm, the little L1 norm on the matrices and the bias vectors to get sparsity. Once I have that, I have to solve this minimization problem. Uh, and so this is done by stochastic gradient descent. Well, I mean, why don't we use just gradient descent? Well, because then, I mean, you would need to compute a gradient m times. And if you have a million samples, I mean, that's just not feasible. So therefore, what you basically do, roughly speaking, is you pre-select, or not pre-select, you randomly choose each time certain of these i's, so of these samples, and just compute the gradient for those. And then assume that this gives you a good average. So that's the stochasticity in stochastic gradient descent. Now, once you've solved the optimization problem, then you have your weight matrices and your bias vectors, and you have your function. Now, and then what you hope is that then this function is close to your original function f. Uh, and then the closeness is given, or you can test this now by the test data set. So now on both sides, on f and on the network function, you plug in your xi's from the test data set and you hope that you get f of x. Yeah, so that's basically the workflow, how you use neural networks. And we saw neural networks already quite old from 1943. So why did they come up now? Um, well, I mean, we have now two advantages. The first advantage is that we have now much more computing power than we had before. And so the advantage is that therefore now we can actually train deep neural networks, networks with hundreds of layers. That seems to make a huge difference. The second is because you saw, I mean, we need maybe a million training examples sometimes. The age of data started, and so we have vast amount of training data available. So these are maybe the two main reasons why these methods now became so effective. Um, but still, I mean, it's, it's a big mystery. And let me also very briefly say what maybe the main parts of this mystery are. 
that it, it really works and why it's so surprising. Um, but first of all, although, I mean, you have millions of parameters which you have to choose, so millions of, let's say, um, weights and biases, the network does not what one says overfit. So what, what is this overfitting phenomenon? Um, so let's assume you have here two data sets, the green one and the blue one, and you would like to separate them. And let's say your neural network is not that expressive, it can just draw lines between those. Then, I mean, that will not work, obviously. Huh? So that's called underfitting. Then, if the network has a bit more flexibility, maybe a bit more parameters, maybe you can separate them this way. And that seems quite reasonable because this might be also an outlier. But then if the network has too much flexibility, what could happen is that it times tries to enclose one of these data sets too closely. Yeah, and now you see, I mean, that becomes very unnatural. If you then have a new data point, it might end up here, a blue one, and it's wrongly classified. So that would be overfitting, and for some reason neural networks usually do not do that. No, so that's one of the, the mysteries. And Sorry, if, um, if uh, you take a look here, so that's what also statistical learning theory tells you. It tells you the, so the capacity of F would here, H would correspond here to the size of the neural network, and this is the error. Now, so this is a training error, and certainly if you have more and more and more parameters, I mean, then, well, I mean, the training error will go on to, to zero. Whereas the test error, um, will at some point again increase. And that's when this phenomena of overfitting happens. But these days, instead, we observe what's called this double descent curve. At some point, the test error goes down again and much more closely to zero than it was before. And so neural networks are in this regime. And that's what, what's so surprising and what cannot be fully explained at present. Another phenomenon which is also extremely surprising is why stochastic gradient descent works that well. Yeah, it's, it's a highly non-convex problem. And um, so you see here that is what would be gradient descent. Huh? So you have your minima here, you start somewhere, and then you have this path which the algorithm constructs or follows to get to one minima. But with stochastic gradient descent, everything becomes more er erratic. Yeah, because you have this stochasticity in there, and so you might miss one of the minima and end up here. And then if you, in addition, know that you optimize over such a complicated landscape, it is extremely surprising why uh, this algorithm often ends up in a minimum, which is also kind of reasonable. Okay, so what are now the key theoretical questions? The first question, remember what we did before, well, first, we had to choose the architecture. So that's called expressivity. Uh, so the question is which aspects of the neural network architecture affect the performance of deep learning. And so areas which are involved there concerning mathematics are, for instance, particular approximation theory. The second is the learning procedure. So here we ask questions like, why does stochastic gradient descent converge to good local minima? Ah, and so there goes a lot of optimization, optimal control, but also areas, for instance, like algebraic differential geometry to study the geometry of these local minima. The generalization question. Yeah? So remember, in the end, we need to estimate the test error. So here the question is, for instance, also what is the role of DAPs and why do large neural networks not overfit? So these are typically questions from the statistical um, learning theory. And then, maybe last but not least, from my perspective, um, a bit different type of question is explainability, which asks the question, now oh, I have my neural network, how can I explain why it reached a certain decision? Yeah, so these are all in the, let's say, in the procedure um, questions concerning proceeding and uh, obtaining a trained neural network. And in fact, these three are exactly the three components of a statistical learning error. The last one, the fourth one, is I already have the trained neural network. I don't know how it was trained, but I would like to analyze it. And um, I would now, I mean, later on, I will focus a little bit more in detail on expressivity, 
we already discussed briefly learning and generalization, why it's so surprising. And um, I won't have time to say much about explainability, but, but because I think that's such an exciting area and it's really lacking mathematics, let me just spend uh, two or three slides on that. And so what is this explainability? Well, the, un the, the goal is to understand how decisions are reached. And so, for instance, here you have a three, and the network, let's say, also classified this as a three. And then what this area aims to do is it aims to explain what the reason for this decision is. So here it would highlight, for instance, the pixels and say, well, I mean, these red pixels are really important for the network for the decision to obtain a three. Now, why? Because that, I mean, that's also natural or reasonable because then you have an open opening here. And so, for instance, the network would need to check that to distinguish this from an eight. If this what was my input for the network and the network said it was an eight, then I mean, these pixels um, for that decision might have been playing against the decision. Mm -hmm. And so the questions which, which one can ask in this regime is, um, uh, so if you look at these, these heat maps or these relevance maps, that looks nice. Yeah, so for instance, the networks thought that these pixels are relevant for it being three, but it's not clear what is exactly relevance. And also, how do we get an optimal relevance map? And if you have also other modalities. Yeah, so in the end, I mean, what, what you would like to have is maybe uh, an explanation which is indistinguishable from a human explanation. And so for instance, um, what we did was we, I mean, introduced a little bit of mathematics from Ray Strawson theory there. Um, we formulated that as an optimization problem and got a very flexible approach. And let me just show you two examples so that you see um, what, what you can do these days with it. But still, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a huge open area. And I think for mathematics, really exciting and uh, needed to uh, put this on more theoretical feet. Uh, so this is, for instance, an example from very different area, telecommunication. You have here a city map. You have these red cell phone users. You have here the location of a cell tower, the white blob here. And the neural network now computed this black and white background, which tells you at each point how good the reception there is. And then what it did was actually very strange to us. Yeah, so you see it produced this black area here. Although if you stand here, you stand right in front of the cell tower. And so we were wondering if the network did maybe something wrong. And so using this explainability method, we found out the network based its decision on those cell phone users. Uh, and, and those cell phone users have a bad reception. Uh, and so therefore it placed this black blob here. And what learned, later turned out is that in fact, there was a building missing in the city map. Uh, so that way you can also understand why new network reach decisions and maybe whether they're wrong or not. Or another application is also adversarial examples. Uh, sometimes you have misclassifications. And so here, for instance, um, the network classified this as a baby and this as a screw. If you just do this pixel-based relevance map, which tells you for each pixel how relevant it is, this is what you get and this is what you get. So you don't have any idea why the neural network said this is a baby and this is a screw. But then if you do it in a bit more sophisticated way, uh, so what we, sorry, what we did was also we involved um, wavelets to some extent, then you see this is what the network saw. Uh, and then it looks a bit like, like a baby here and here you see that indeed, I mean, one can think a bit of a screw in that direction. Okay, so this was a small glimpse into explainability. And yeah, so as I said, I think it's a really exciting area. So this is mathematics for deep learning. And I said, there is also the other side, which is deep learning for mathematics. And so here I would like to mention two different directions. One is inverse problems in imaging sciences, where we ask how can we, for instance, combine deep learning with previous methods and maybe if we can throw everything what we know overboard and just uh, replace everything with neural networks and uh, train it end to end. 
And the other area is um, partial differential equations. And so here questions are, and I already said, uh, neural networks are effective in this regime because they perform that well in high dimensional environments and the question could be why. Okay, so these are the key directions. I mean, when one aims to solve and let's uh, go in a bit more detail into some of those. Um, and certainly, I mean, the first question one can also ask is, if we, we see all that, I mean, are deep neural networks at least as good as all previous methods? Now, previous methods, I mean, usually use tools um, for approximation. Uh, so if you think, for instance, for, for inverse problem, a deep neural network is used for approximation and also in the regime of partial differential equation. Yeah, so that's what neural networks do in these algorithms. They are used for approximation tasks. And so then one can ask the question, what about approximation does deep neural networks, do deep neural networks are as good approximators as other methods? <coughs> okay, so this is the area of expressivity. Now, so the question we ask is, um, I have my f, it belongs to a let's say, function class. I have my class of neural networks. And then I can ask, I mean, um, if I now want to approximate this function by a neural network, um, up to, let's say, some epsilon, which complexity does the neural network need to have? <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so what you want to do is you want to control complexity. We want to have a small neural network, and maybe we also want to have an optimal approximator. And one very, very classical result in this regime, uh, which people always mention, is the universal approximation theory. So what does it say? It looks very complicated, but it basically says that if you have a continuous function on a compact domain, then neural networks of this type, shallow neural networks, just with one hidden layer, approximate these functions as good as you want. Yeah, so, and I mean, the phrasing uh, you can read here. So if you have a function continuous on a compact domain and my activation function is continuous, not a polynomial, then no matter which accuracy you choose, you always find a shallow neural network. Yeah? And so this is exactly a neural network of this type, which approximates this f with this accuracy. Yeah? So that's a powerful result. But I mean, it, for instance, does not tell you anything about the complexity. It, it also doesn't explain why, neural net, why deep neural networks are that effective. So now to get a bit more into the heart of that, um, let me just very briefly review classical approximation theory with you. And then we will see that in fact, I mean, neural networks are as good as, yeah, many things of what we did before. Okay, classical approximation theory. Um, what does it do? The key question people always ask is, I have a class of functions, let's say a subset of L2RD. And I have, let's say, an orthonormal basis. And then I want to understand how good this function system is for approximating functions from this class. Yeah, and so approximation theory provides us with uh, a lot of notions in that respect, um, in particular, the notion of best n-term approximation. So I take a function out of my function class. I have a budget, capital N, and now I'm allowed to choose n elements of my system and coefficients, build a linear combination, and use this to approximate f. And I want to do it in such a way that, well, this error is minimal. What I then get is a best n term approximation, the best approximation of f with n terms, and this is the error of best n term approximation. Then I can let n go to infinity, and if this is a complete system, the error will go to zero. And so then I can ask at which rate does it go to zero. Uh, and so the larger gamma, the better. 
my system is for approximating functions in C. Uh, so this, in a way, sets into relation the approximation accuracy with the complexity of the system in terms of sparsity, because here I aim for very few terms. Now, so let's let's fill this with, with life a bit. Um, so, for instance, I mean, one would like to approximate images. Um, images are based on directional structures. You see here some images, and you see, I mean, directional structures are key also for the human visual system. Um, wavelets, which some of you might know as a nice representation system, as a nice basis, are not that good because wavelets um, are, if you see how they look like, they are like a little square and you need many to approximate such directional structures. It would be much better to have structures of this type, um, a bit elongated. And so this leads us to the definition of uh, so-called shearlets. Um, uh, and so what, what shearlets are, you see basically here, you see you have um, a system where you have here uh, a translation parameter where you move uh, your shearlet on the plane. You have another parameter, which is um, a scaling parameter. And yeah, I mean, the okay, so... So yeah, so what you, what you should see is that it actually moves a bit and becomes very elongated. If you change J, you see you move it in two directions in a different way that creates this elongated structures. And uh, you have a third component, which is a component to change the orientation of those. Uh, and so these are shearlets. The they tile the frequency domain in this way. You see here very directional structure, you can, in a very precise manner, detect the different directions. And um, one, one can show, I mean, just loosely speaking, that in fact, uh, the error of best n term approximation is optimal, has an optimal rate of n to the minus 1, up to a log factor. Uh, so one can say, I mean, loosely speaking, Shields fulfill the optimal compression rate for a certain class of functions, and these are so-called cartoon-like functions. Oh, and so if you're interested in that, I mean, we also have an extensive software package, shieldet.org. Yeah, so, I mean, this is one example of um, what we saw here. So we can take the so-called class of cartoon-like functions. These are functions which are governed by direction structures. And then if we take shearlets, then this gives me the optimal approximation rate. Yeah, so that's one example. Uh, and so now, I mean, one can ask, can neural networks do the same? And in fact, they do. So one, one can show the following. Um, this slide, um, we already saw before, that's just the definition of a neural network, but I, I told you, I mean, the complexity is key. We saw before, so if I go back. Um, yeah, so here in this normal regime, we take the complexity in terms of sparsity. But now we need to decide what we do for neural networks. What is the complexity of a neural network? And what one can take there and what one usually take is the number of non-zero elements in the weight matrices and the bias vectors. Yeah, so the number of non-zero parameters. That's in a certain sense natural because that's the, also the storage capacity you need for a neural network. Uh, and so then, I mean, you can ask, um, can you now set into relation the approximation accuracy with the complexity of the neural network in terms of memory efficiency? Yeah, because this relates to the memory efficiency. Oh, and so what we, for instance, could prove there is we, we proved a lower bound, which each on the complexity, uh, which each training and learning algorithm needs to obey and then show that this bound can be attained and that led to the result that, in fact, I mean, new networks are as good concerning approximation as uh, classical systems. Uh, so let me just walk you through these. Results so here, what you see is that's a natural learning procedure. It takes an accuracy 
and an element of this class and outputs a neural network in such a way that this um, function from the class is approximated by the neural network with that accuracy. Uh, so that's in some sense a, a crude modeling of every learning procedure. And then we could prove that now if you look at the complexity of these neural networks, which are learned, if you multiply this with epsilon to gamma, this product converges to infinity. So that means this complexity goes to infinity faster than epsilon to gamma um, converges to zero. Yeah, so in a sense, I mean, here you see that uh, as epsilon goes to zero, this um, complexity converges faster to infinity than um, epsilon to minus gamma. Yeah, so this gives me a lower bound for the complexity of these produced neural networks. And then we could show that if, yeah, this gamma is equal to this gamma star, and gamma star is, is a certain parameter which um, depends on my class, so it measures in certain sense the complexity, how complicated this class is, which I want to approximate. And so what we can then show is that um, indeed, if you now use new networks for approximating things, and you do that in a specific way, namely, you do that in a way like you do it with normal approximation theory. You mimic an M-term approximation by new networks, which leads to architectures of this type. Then, if you build your neural networks that way, you can show that for any of these cartoon-like functions, you can approximate that with a neural network with this accuracy. And you see this n to the minus 1 here again. So if I go back, um, then you see that, um, uh, see, where it is. Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so you see this n to the minus 1. Yeah, so in that sense, I mean, we um, yeah. So in that sense, I mean, it shows that with neural networks you can get as good approximation rates as you can do with other um, the classical results. Yeah. So this shows also this bound which you just saw is sharp. And yeah. So as I say here, I mean, deep neural networks are as good um, approximators uh, as all of these affine systems combined, wavelets, shearlets, and whatever you can think of. What is in addition surprising is that, I mean, what you see here, I said, this is uh, these are the networks which we now use for approximating tasks. What you see here is these tiny neurons, uh, neural networks, these are the ones which we then use, for instance, for mimicking a wavelet or a shearlet. And then, since you want to mimic uh, this M-term approximation, we also combine them. But now you can also do this the other way around. You can say, I take this architecture and I train it. What do I get? And what is very surprising is that in these compartments, because these are again functions from R2 to R, in these compartments, if you do that, you learn something which from approximation theory is very natural. In fact, I mean, what you do is for instance, if you train your neural network of these functions, you learn functions of this type. And here you learn functions of this type. So the neural network learns what is called richlets and also shearlets in a kind of automatic way. Okay, so this is um, concerning expressivity. And we saw that neural networks in that sense are as good as everything what we have done before. Now you can ask, are they really better? So I would like to argue that, in fact, they are. Um, uh, so let's, say, let's take a look at inverse problems. That's very classical. We have a problem where we have an operator. Um, for instance, an operator which takes things out of the image. And um, what you now have is you have your image G, and you would recover F, the original image. You can do that by solving an optimization problem of this type. 
Um, and uh, what you see here is if you solve this, this is the data fidelity term, you solve, you want to solve this inverse problem as accurately as possible. And here you have the regularization term, which you typically, uh, for which you typically use a representation system. And um, you could use, for instance, shielded here. And there are various ways now to combine these classical methods with deep learning approaches. For instance, you can first solve it this way and then add a neural network. Or you can, um, in your optimizer, you can insert the neural network in certain ways because sometimes there is an, a denoising step. You can then replace this denoising step in your solver with a neural network. And one other combination of how you combine neural networks um, with classical solvers, uh, I would like to very briefly now show you, uh, is computed tomography. So let's assume you want to solve this Radon transform. Uh, the Radon transform is what a CT scanner does. You have someone lying here in this tube. And uh, the Radon transform takes line integrals and then this gives me one slice of the so-called sinogram, and then it is rotated around you, and that way you fill the sinogram. So that's the Radon transform, and now from this, you would like to cover the interior of the human body. This becomes very hard if you don't have access to the full data, if you cannot do the full 180 degrees, but only parts of it. So you have a whole chunk missing, which, for instance, is the case in electron tomography. Uh, and so the problem this causes is what you see here. Uh, so if you, for instance, have a 60 degree missing angle, this is the reconstruction you get because you have this whole chunk missing. And maybe the best classical methods, so if you use shields for on the previous slide, you still have a lot of blurry parts. Uh, but now the question is, can you use neural networks for that? And um, the way one can do that is, I mean, first of all, one realizes that as a very early stage, uh, so this is, we increase now the angle of missing of, of available data. Uh, so what, what, what you see is that at a very early stage, some of these edges are visible and others are not. I mean, that's in a sense clear because if you, for instance, compute the line integrals this way, I mean, things are smeared out. Uh, and you can make this mathematically very precise. So since edges and so on are so important, um, what one can use is one can use shields for that because shields have the ability to detect edges. Again, one can make this mathematically precise. I don't want to go into the details. If you're familiar with, for instance, wavefront sets, I mean, that's uh, the way you can phrase it. So shields can detect very precisely the position of singularities and their direction and position and direction that's what you call a wave front set and so what what we can do is i mean we can now proceed in the following steps we first solve our problem inverse problem in the classical way as we saw on the previous slide that is the data fidelity term you see here the rod on transform and you see here the regularization term was the Schiele transform. Then we get this blurry part here and here. And what we now do is we again apply such a Schiele transform. And we see that in certain parts, so the Schiele transform is the inner product of this F star, this kind of defected image with Schiele's. In certain parts, this is zero, and in other parts, it's reliable. And those we don't touch. Yeah, and so now we just learn the part which is not reliable. So that means we, in a way, decompose the data in such a way that we get access to where um, the uh, where the missing data is. And so that we train with a neural network. We pack everything together, and we get results of this type. Yeah, so that's the original. That is a very crude reconstruction from a 60-degree missing angle. That's the best you can do with uh, classical methods. That is what you can do with an entire neural network um, without any model-based methods. And this is already better. And here you get a combination 
Uh, you take the combination of both <clears throat> and you see you do far better than anything uh, which you had done before. And so one can then say that deep neural networks, if you combine that with classical methods, outperform classical methods by far. Uh, so um, this is another example where we do edge detection with directionality. And again, you see deep neural networks, if you combine that here also with shielded outperform everything by far. So I see I'm a bit already over time. Um, let me just say, therefore, I mean, for partial differential equations, um, one can also argue to some extent why new networks are that effective for partial differential equations, but I don't want to go too much into the details because I think my time is also, also running out. Um, let me just very briefly say, that um, for new networks, typically, uh, for partial differential equations, typically, what people do is they plug in the neural network instead of the solution. So that's their ansatz function. And then they train a neural network and get the solution of the PDEs. Uh, and so one can do that, for instance, also for uh, parametric PDEs, again, using the neural network as uh, an ansatz function for the solution. And in fact, I mean, if one does that, um, one can show results of the type existence results that there exists neural networks, which actually approximate the solution. Um, one can get results about the complexity of these neural networks that they beat the curse of dimensionality. And one can get results, numerical results that in fact, from a numerical viewpoint, um, also there you have, um, the effect that the curse of dimensionality is beaten. Okay, so let me just finish with some final thoughts. I mean, I hope uh, you agree. Deep learning shows impressive performance. A theoretical foundation is largely missing. A lot of mathematics is needed to attack that. These were the directions I discussed uh, concerning mathematics for deep learning. And then there's the other direction, deep learning for mathematics, which studies mostly inverse problems and PDEs. This is um, a small list of, let's say, the key problems which we phrase in this article, which you see down here. And these are also the key questions which we discussed, in a sense, during this talk. So from that perspective, I think there are exciting future perspectives for AI and mathematics. And with this, I'd like to conclude. and. Thanks a lot for your attention. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot, Gita, for this very, very interesting talk. We have uh, some uh, uh, amount of questions. Uh, some of them are just basic uh, uh, introductory uh, question like, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the main difference between a deep narrow network and a narrow network, but this is uh, quite uh, simplistic, I mean, as regards the number of layers uh, that are involved, right? So, Yeah, in a sense, I mean, I think everything from layer number of layer three or four on one today calls a deep neural network, as opposed to a shadow neural network, yeah. Uh, another question uh, is about uh, you can read it. Uh, what what the, the purpose of using activation function uh, um, and, and why ReLU is used instead of other functions? So yeah, so the activation function brings in the nonlinearity. I mean, otherwise, you just have a linear approximator, which, which is certainly not uh, powerful enough. Um, so the activation function brings in the nonlinearity in a, let's say, um, yeah, kind of easy way because it's just a univariate function, which you apply component-wise. Uh, concerning the ReLU, um, it's a piecewise linear function. It's it's an easy function, and but still, I mean, it's sufficient to give um, the results we want. So in that sense, I know it's not maybe a satisfactory explanation, but I mean, that's why people use it. It's also easy for training, piecewise linear, I mean, not that complicated, um, and it gives uh, very good results. Okay, another question. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. 
by Blanca Ayuso, the approximation L2 is an existent result. What about the practical, practical construction of the neural network that achieve optimal rate? What about the other norms? If it yeah, so it's also some application. Sorry. Yeah, so that's also a very good question. Um, you're right. I mean, that's an existence result. It shows there exists neural networks. It's not clear that when you train it, you you op obtain um, the the optimal rate. Um, so what I showed you is that with a specific architecture, um, that there you could actually get this this optimal rate. Um, but it's not, not guaranteed. I mean, what would be certainly much nicer would be if you also have a mathematical result which talks about success of uh, stochastic gradient descent. Now, concerning other norms, um, concerning Sobolev norms, I mean, there are also results already of, of that type. So this area of expressivity is, in a sense, I mean, I think the most developed area these days because that um, also started with the universal approximation theory and um, on the shallow regime and now concerning deep neural networks. So this is uh, the, the, the area which is the furthest developed and the generalization question is, I think, the least developed. Okay, we have now a, a live question from our colleagues, Giovanni and Sebastiani, please go on. You're live. Uh, Ali, hello, can you hear us? Do you hear me? Yeah. Sure. Do you hear me? Sure, yes, yes, we do. Okay, so... Uh, Please go on. Go on, Giovanni. You can ask the Hello? question if you want. Giovanni, can you hear us? Okay, let, let's postpone this question, then there's another uh, question by Daniela Di Canditis. What is your personal intuition about the double descent curve of the generalization for error for uh, neural networks? Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting question. I mean, as I said, it's, it's a big mystery. I mean, there need to be some, let's say, inner regularization which happens to achieve this. Um, and I mean, there are some, let's say, I ideas, but um, it's, it's, it's far from being clear. I mean, there are for instance, I mean, things like VC dimension and, and so on, what people use for statistical learning theory for a long time, I mean, will not get the result we want. So what people these days use are, for instance, neural tension kernels for getting, let's say, um, uh, some maybe also an approximation of this double descent curve. Uh, yeah, and the other directions, I mean, to understand this inner regularization, which happens, but um, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's the best I can say for, for that. Okay, let's try again with Giovanni Sebastiani. Uh, uh, yes, do, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Yes. Hello? Okay. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much for your nice presentation. I enjoyed very, very much. Uh, so my question is uh, about the, the number of liars. So uh, I am a Bayesian guy, so if I have to deal with that, uh, I will, uh, of course, explore the state system by through the reversible jump Marco chain Monte Carlo. But uh, uh, in this case, my question, can I ask the question? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, do you, okay, yes, I hear you. So I, I just... Go on, go on. Yeah, I don't think he hears us. I just have to speak, has to speak. Okay, let's try again later. Uh, let's start with another question. Okay, oops. So, question from uh, uh, our colleague Jean-Francois Mascari. Uh, maths for AI, do you see common maths foundation for uh, for all AI problems and you mentioned? And I think the techniques are, I mean, also different um, for, for the different directions. So um, if, if you would like to, for instance, solve these expressivity questions, I mean, again, you require approximation theoretic methods. I mean, the optimization area is more 
I mean, the learning area is more optimization type uh, questions and generalization is more on the statistical side. So in that sense, I mean, I, I think, and that's also to my mind, uh, the exciting part um, to solve, let's say, or to understand deep learning in its depth requires basically most of the area of, of mathematics. So in that sense, I mean, I think the common ground is mathematics itself, but I mean, um, every area plays its its role. I, I wouldn't say, let's say, approximation theory can solve everything. Uh, so, so in that sense, it's a combination which you require of, of different areas of mathematics. Another question. Are there examples of PDEs that cannot be solved by with deep learning? Yeah, I mean, that's that's actually, yeah, I think that I really like the question because it's, it's a question about limitations of of uh, deep learning. And I think that's a question which is not asked enough these days because people believe deep learning can do everything. Um, so so here, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I'm, actually, I, I cannot answer that, that question because I'm not aware of anything where it really failed because what does it mean? It, it failed um, sometimes if, if you really train a new network, it's, it's also kind of an art. It takes a lot of experience from the programmer. Maybe this person was not experienced enough and therefore it failed to solve this by deep learning. Um, so in that sense, um, what I maybe can say is, I mean, if you have already very sophisticated solvers, find element solvers or so, which are provably optimal, I mean, then this is the question why you actually need deep learning. Uh, so in that sense, then it makes not much sense to use deep learning, but I mean, certainly you, you could also solve it with deep learning. But um, yeah, I, I think it's something which one should explore much more. Another question by Nicola Polonio, how, how the complexity, uh, how is the complexity measure? Yeah, so the complexity, measure complexity here complexity, yeah. is, is measured by the number of non-zero parameters. So non-zero weights and non-zero biases. That's one way to do that. One could also look at the complexity in terms of the number of connections. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are different ways. So another question by Fabio Marcuzzi. How much there is trial and error in obtaining such good, such good results for, for inverse problems? Yeah, also a very good question. I mean, so if, if you train the neural network, I mean, certainly... We also try a lot of different parameters, a lot of different, let's say, initializations for stochastic gradient descent. So in that sense, there's a lot of trial and error in there, yes. Um, so, I mean, you, you saw the algorithm, but we, we think that, for instance, our algorithm, which I showed you, has the advantage that you really only learn what you cannot get otherwise. Yeah, so for all the other parts, you use classical methods where you have error bonds and so on. And here you use I mean, very surgically, a new network only for what you cannot get otherwise. And sure, then that part is uh, also trial and error to some extent. And, and I mean, what one has to certainly say, new network can also sometimes produce artifacts and so on. So um, this is something one, one needs to be aware of. I believe one last question. Uh, finally, by Giovanni Sebastiani, do you have theoretical results get, that can be useful to find optimal value of number of layers? I wish. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, the question is also what 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 do you mean by, by optimal? Um, optimal, I would understand also concerning, for instance, that the training algorithm maybe converge in an optimal manner and so we are far from being able to say anything in, in that direction. I mean, typically these expressivity results are more about you need maybe at least that many layer or at most that many layers so to get bounds on the number of layers, but the optimal value, I mean, um, yeah, it would be nice, but um, I, I'm not aware of any results in that direction. Okay, so the very last one. Uh, it's another question. In the last few years, there is an amazing exponential trend in the state of the art DNA complexity for uh, another language processing and other stuff. Uh, we are reaching the trillion parameter regime. I do believe it uh, can be uh, reached even further than that. Oh, okay. So, so I cannot read the whole question, I think. Um, 
yeah, I think it will, will, will continue to, to grow. Um, I mean, the problem a bit is also that, let's say, in the academic world, we sometimes don't have that good uh, computers than um, companies have or like Google have. So that makes it sometimes also a bit difficult to compete with, with industry in this regime. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it will grow. And um, if you ask people which neural networks to take, because I said it's a lot of trial and error, I mean, then people will often say, well, I mean, take the biggest neural network, which still fits in your GPU. So in that sense, I mean, what often results show is, I mean, the bigger, the better in that sense. I mean, let's say the, the more extensive your neural network is, is the better. And then, I mean, if you also compare it with the human brain, where we also have a huge number of neurons, then um, uh, you, you, you can imagine that, I mean, to reach the human brain and here right now we are just focusing on one specific task whereas the human brain is i mean uh, able to uh, handle a lot of tasks um, simultaneously so in that sense i mean yeah it will it will grow further okay, sorry uh, another a couple of questions that keep coming once we stimulate questions they they never stop. Are there math are <laughs> there math methods to avoid spurious states in AN and classifiers? Well, I mean there are some some results concerning um, yeah, also at the zero examples. Um, but um, to avoid let's say that um, I mean there are even results which show that neural networks are often to some extent faulty in a certain direction. So um, to avoid that, I mean, completely is, um, to my mind, I mean, not, not, not possible right now. Uh, last one, Matteo Garbelli. Is it commonly used in application to calibrate a neural network by, by PDEs like Hamilton, Jacobi, Bellman equation and Wasserstein space? Yeah, that's, that's actually a difficult question. I mean, is it commonly used in applications? I mean, I think practitioners um, won't use that because, I mean, they're not familiar with such deep mathematics. So, I mean, one, one hopes that, I mean, these ideas then I mean, move to applications at some point. But I think, um, yeah, I mean, I would answer the question with, I mean, right now, I guess not. But, I mean, certainly, I mean, mathematics, prepares the stage in that sense okay then we can uh, really thank the speaker that mm, has been uh, uh, has brought us a, a lot of uh, novel and interesting material to 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 discuss and and has, has fostered uh, many questions and some of them I, I have not had the time to show but i mean mm -hmm. thank again gita uh, for, uh, for for the breath and and uh, an interesting um, seminar. We, I will give you uh, the hint for a, in, in a couple of weeks time, we have uh, the next uh, iteration of the seminar with uh, Massimo Fornasier he, always on, on Wednesday. And uh, let's thank again the speaker and all the attendants. Thank you.